Um, yeah, so welcome to the PIPS speaker series. Um, PIPS, very briefly, is a research initiative interested in exploring the parallels between how intelligent behavior manifests in both natural and artificial systems, with the goal of leveraging these insights towards understanding potential risks from artificial intelligence systems, and also figuring out how to build those systems, hopefully in a way that is safe and, and aligned. Um, our guest today is Josh Bongard. Um, Josh is the Vaynaut Professor of Computer Science at the University of Vermont and the Director of the Morphology, Evolution and Cognition Laboratory. His work revolves around the, around the automated design and manufacturing of soft, evolved and crowdsourced robots, as well as, com as computer designed organisms. Today, Josh will be talking about discovering the adjacent possible um, with AI. So in the talk, Josh will be adapting the notion of the adjacent possible that was first introduced in a biological context to talk about ways in which AI might come to discover new adjacent bi biological structures, um, how AI can use those new, this new fun knowledge to design new types of organisms, and how AI can incorporate this knowledge back into sort of next generation AI and robotics. And I think Josh will also be sharing some reflection on what this interplay between biology and technology might reveal about the nature of intelligent machines more generally, and be that biological or technological. Um, so I think Josh said he's happy to take questions throughout. If the audience, uh, you have any questions, you can like raise your hand and we'll, we'll be able to allow you to speak. Um, yeah, I think that's all that I wanna say. And then over to you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Nora. And thanks to uh, to all of you for uh, tuning in. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see that? Okay. Yes. Can you all see my screen? All right. Uh, yes, we see yeah. it. Great. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so um, good to good to uh, be here, be here, so to speak. Um, I'm Josh Bongard. I'm based here at the University of Vermont. And just to orient you, Vermont is tucked way up in the northeastern corner of the United States, just uh, between Boston to the south and Montreal in Canada to the to the north. So. Um, as Nora said, I'm going to present for, I've got about uh, an hour worth of material here, um, but I will pause from time to time and take questions. I can obviously hear you and I can see chat and I can see Q&A. So feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or ask a question through Nora or type a question into chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat window. And if I see any questions there, I'll pause and, and answer them. Um, always better for these to, uh, presentations to be interactive rather than me chatting at you for an hour. So uh, as Nora promised, what I want to try and do is present a, a bunch of material to you, but arrange it around this concept of the adjacent uh, possible. So Stuart Kaufman, uh, a theoretical biologist, uh, coined this term, the adjacent possible, and it's based uh, in turn on another idea, which is morphospace. And this is an idea that might be familiar to the biologists among you, uh, but maybe not to the non-biologists among you. Um, morphospace is an abstract mathematical space that contains all existing organisms, or all existing species, and all species that uh, have existed on this planet. So you can think of this as a very morphospace as a very high dimensional space. And every point in that space represents either an organism that does exist, or a species that does exist, and, or a species that has existed, or a species that could exist, a hypothetical species that obeys all the laws of uh, physics, but has not yet been discovered by, an ev by evolution. As you can imagine, this is a vast space. Um, we are routinely awed by the diversity we see in the life around us, but even that existing diversity is dwarfed by potential diversity, all the kinds of organisms that could exist. That's morphospace. Uh, Stuart Kaufman talks about the adjacent possible. If you visit any one point in this space, any existing organism, what is adjacent to that existing or past species? What's the adjacent possible? What else could be discovered by a short move from what is to what could be in morphospace? 
I always found that a very inspiring idea. Um, I'm not a biologist, I'm a roboticist. So I tend to think not so much about morpho space, but about robo space, the, the space of all possible intelligent machines um, that we as a species have built so far. And then the adjacent possible in robo space. What are the kinds of machines we could build that would be a little bit more competent than the ones we have, a little bit more safe, a little bit more aligned with human values uh, and wants and needs uh, and so on. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about some of my, the research projects that I've been involved in and what we've created. And what I hope you will see is they, they are the adjacent possible. They're things a little bit unorthodox or a little bit different from what's existed so far. So just to uh, paint a 10,000 foot view of, of what I want to talk about, I'm actually going to start with AI. Um, my understanding is that there's some biologists some philosophers here you've all obviously heard of AI, but I'm going to talk about some of the basics of AI and how it actually works to show you then in the next part uh, of what I have to show how we can use AI and ask the AI to design new kinds of machines and new kinds of organisms for us. So it's hard for us as humans to dream up a brand new kind of machine or design a whole new kind of organism. It's but it seems we are able to be able to train an AI and tell an AI to go find the adjacent possible for us, go find new kinds of intelligent and safe machines and new kinds of organisms for us. So as I mentioned, I talk about robots. Here's a robot I worked on a number of years ago. Um, this is the Xenobot that you see in the bottom uh, center. You can argue that this is a new kind of organism, an AI designed organism, and we'll spend a, a, a few minutes talking about the Xenobots. And then I'm going to end by talking about this thing that you're looking at at the bottom right. This is um, not necessarily a robot or an organism. It's a metamaterial, and we'll talk about what metamaterials are. It is intelligent. It is an intelligent metamaterial, but is it, intel it is intelligent in a way that no existing machine is. And it's a form of intelligence that at least we don't know yet exists in organisms. So one of the fun things about asking AI to find new things in morpho space or robo space or the space of all possible machines is AI often finds things that defy human intuition. They're not things that a human engineer would have been likely to have dreamed up. Okay. Okay, so as promised, uh, I wanted to start with AI. Um, so for about the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna give you a crash course in AI. For those of you that know how deep neural networks work and how generative AI works, I apologize. This is gonna be uh, very remedial for, for you, but, but bear with me. So um, how do we train AI? We train it using induction. We collect a training set, which contains a large number of examples of the thing we want the AI to learn. So imagine we have a huge number of images of different animals, like cats and dogs, for example. We take each image or exemplar in our training set and we uh, expose it to the quote unquote eye of the AI. This is the input part to the AI. And from the point of view of the AI, this eye, all it, it does not see a cat because it doesn't understand that cats exist. All it sees is uh, numbers. It sees colorized pixels. So it just sees raw data. It's like in the matrix with all the, the green symbols falling. It just, just sees numbers. There is an algorithm or a mathematical process that takes all those raw numbers representing the colors in the image and compresses them into a smaller representation. Um, it sort of combines those numbers together in a particular way and and for the sake of today, at least i'll refer to this as uh, i'll refer to this as. The brain of our neural network and then there are some more compression steps until at the end in the output layer you have a very small number of numbers you have a very short vector of numbers in my in my cartoon example here we're going to assume that there are just two numbers that result from this compression 
at the beginning of training, an AI just compresses these numbers together in a random way. It doesn't know how to do anything yet. So in the absence of any knowledge, it just kind of flips a coin, so to speak. It does stuff at random. And by doing things at random and compressing these numbers down ultimately into two numbers, there are two possible results. Either the first number is bigger than the second number or the second number is bigger than the first number. In my cartoon example here, we'll assume that just by chance, the second number happened to be larger than the first number. And the humans who built this AI have decided that for this AI at the mouth layer, the output where we're trying to get the AI to tell us whether it see what, what particular animal it sees, the human trainers have decided that the first number, if the first number is bigger than the second number, that's the AI telling us that it sees a dog. If the first number is bigger than the second number, that's the AI telling us that it sees a cat. In this cartoon example here, this random compression was wrong. It, the second number is larger than the first number, so this is the AI telling us that it thinks it sees a dog. As we know by looking at this, it's made a mistake. So there's an old algorithm that was invented back in the 1980s called the back propagation of error, which takes that mistake and goes backwards. It back propagates that error from the output layer, from the mouth to the brain, to the eye, and undoes all the compressions along the way that resulted in this mistake. So Take a moment and think about uh, all the mistakes you've made over the last week. I don't know about you, but for me, it's a long list. All the things you said that you shouldn't have said, or the things you didn't say that you should have said, or the things you didn't do that you should have done and vice versa. <laughs> I want you to think about all those mistakes. And for each one of those mistakes, I want you to think about what led up to that mistake. What were the things you did that led to you making a mistake? I don't know about you, but I cannot complete that task. I can, I can barely think about all the things I did wrong, let alone what caused me to make those mistakes. Machines, on the other hand, when programmed correctly, can remember everything. So a neural network or an AI is designed so that it can remember all of the, the steps in this compression, and it can trace back the origins of all these errors. And along the way, it sort of combs out the tangles in the hair. It, tangle, it combs out all of these origins of the mistake and changes this compression algorithm, the way it compressed the numbers. By doing that, the next time it's presented with exactly the same picture, now, it's going to do that compression in a slightly different way. And since it's combed out all of those errors, this time the, at the end of all these compression steps, the first number is gonna be bigger than the second number and it's going to get the right answer. There will be zero error. It did the right thing, which means it does not need to propagate error backwards. I'll just pause for a moment, any questions? Can I clarify anything? So far, so good. Okay. I don't hear anything, so I'll assume everything's uh, everything's okay. All right. So that, as I mentioned, there's a training set with a very large number of images or a very large number of YouTube videos. Obviously, we we don't train it just on one image. We train it on multiple images, different images of cats, different images of dogs, and we do this forward pass and backward pass many, many times with different images. And every time we're combing out the local mistakes. And it turns out if you do this, or if Google has the resources to do this millions and billions of times for millions or billions of images or videos or text that's scraped from the internet, this machine can comb out almost all the errors so that it gets really, really good at recognizing cats, recognizing dogs, uh, and so on. That's AI in a nutshell. Again, I apologize. I know I'm skipping, I'm skipping over a lot of uh, details here. Let's move on from AI to generative AI. 
once you've finished training an AI in the way that I just described, you can now, in an essence, play it backwards so that you can now treat this output layer like a piano, where you can set the values of these output, the values of these output neurons or the values inside this output vector. It's like playing a piano. You can set the cat uh, value to one and you can set the dog value to zero and in essence what you're asking the AI to do is to generate an image that it thinks best represents that concept cat so if you set this value to one uh, this placeholder to one this placeholder to zero and then you run this compression algorithm in reverse it's a decompression algorithm. It decompresses these two numbers into more and more numbers. And then at the end, that large group of numbers is interpreted as colors. And you can then paint a picture of what the trained AI thinks is the most cat-like image it could ever receive, which for an actual AI, this is the result. Okay. Um, you can do the same thing by then setting the dog neuron uh, to one and generating or decompressing through the trained AI and you get something like this. I'm sure you've all seen this before. It's now known as dreaming or hallucination, but that's that's sort of what generative AI is. Okay. Uh, you can also do this with videos, and I'm sure you've all seen this kind of thing uh, before. Again, I mentioned you can treat the output uh, the output values is a piano. So this is someone pressing down more or less on the dog, uh, on the dog neuron, which generates a whole bunch of images, which if you stitch them together, you get something that looks like this. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, that's AI and generative AI. Um, my research area focuses on AI generated or AI designed robots. Robots are physical things. They're not non-physical things like images or videos. So what I'm gonna show you is how in my group, we take this idea and uh, adapt it slightly so that it generates now not images or videos, but generates robots or xenobots or meta, meta materials, physical things. The first change we make is to change the eye of this AI. So instead of it being a flat set of 2D things like pixels or frames in an animation, we turn the eye into a 3D thing. Now, when we press on this output, on these two output values here and decompress this back, the decompression results in what's known as a tensor. This is a three-dimensional vector. Um, and the colors here represent the different values sitting inside of this tensor, inside of this 3D uh, vector. So in essence, we now have a, a generative AI that paints colors, not onto a two, 2D canvas, but onto a 3D canvas. The next step, uh, and then again, by pressing on these different uh, output uh, neurons, by setting different values, we can paint different pictures. The next step that we take is to interpret these different colors as instructions. So we're actually now starting to go from a set of numbers to a computer program, a set of instructions. In my cartoon example here, gray values, uh, gray, gray uh, voxels here, voxels are 3D pixels. You can think of these as very uh, low val values that are very close to zero. And we've told the computer to treat values that are very close to zero as stuff that should be deleted or removed. So you can see in this, again, in this cartoon here, we're starting to scrape away or delete parts of this 3D structure that are gray. Okay, if we scrape away all the gray, we're left with an object. It's a virtual object here, but it's an object made up of different colored cubes. And we're now going to physicalize this object. We're gonna take this object and send it 
to a physics engine. We send it to basically a video game or a, a, um, an artificial world where in that artificial world, the computer knows to treat these different colors as now different physical properties. What you're looking at here in this picture here, um, we told the computer to treat blue voxels as soft and uh, soft and passive voxels. What does that mean? You can see that uh, these blue voxels are uh, stretching and twisting a little bit, increasing and decreasing in volume. The red and green voxels, uh, the computer treats the red and green voxels as something like muscle. These, are, these voxels increase and decrease in volume on their own. They're active. <laughs> Um, you can think about these as uh, hollow voxels, sort of hollow cages that are made out of soft uh, silicone rubber. And you can imagine we're pushing air into it, which causes it to increase like a balloon, or if we take air out of it to shrink like a balloon. And I think I have, I thought I had a physical one here with me today, but I forgot. We've actually made some of these. Anyways, we've gone from taking this non-physical object, put it in a virtual world where the virtual world is now simulating it as a, as a physical object. So you can see now we've gone from 2D images of cats to something that's starting to resemble a robot, a machine, which in this case is a soft machine. It's made up of soft parts. And these soft parts have different properties. The red green ones are like muscles that increase and decrease in volume. And the blue ones are like fat. They're like passive soft material that's being pulled and pushed by uh, the muscle part of this machine. I'll just pause here for a moment. Again, that's a lot of material. Um, any questions or anything I can go back over and clarify? No? Okay. I'm not well, seeing any hands so far. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, what I've shown you in this again example um, is an untrained AI. It's got a ran. We haven't trained it like we did with the cat images. There's a random set. There's a random way in which these numbers are deconstructed or decompressed to paint or generate this virtual robot. We can then ask the following question: How do we tune this decompression part? so that it generates a robot that does something useful for us. In the example I'm gonna show you uh, in a moment, let's imagine we want this AI to generate a robot that moves from left to right along a flat surface as quickly as possible. What should be the 3D geometry of this machine and what should be the various material properties of the parts that it's made up of? Where should the AI put muscle? Where should it put bone? Where should it put fat? That would lead to something that moves as quickly as possible. Um, in this GIF that I just showed you, this one, this is the first thing that the AI comes up with when, the, when this decompression is random. This is a randomly painted or randomly generated robot, which as you can see, does a very poor job at moving from left to right. It basically just bounces up and down in place. I'm going to switch metaphors now. We've been talking about this thing as something resembling a brain. I want you to think about all the details now of this decompression uh, process as DNA. We've got a whole bunch of pieces of information in here, which is how to decompress, and we can mutate this DNA. We can reach into this decompression process and slightly change the way that these two numbers are decompressed into four, into eight, into 16, into all of these. And if we do, if we reach in and make a slight change to this generative process, to this decompression process, we might get something that looks like this. So we've got two different, uh, two different pieces of DNA here, two different genomes that decompress into two slightly different phenotypes, two slightly different virtual creatures. And I picked these two examples on purpose because the one you can see in the bottom right happens to move from the left side, moves from left to right a little bit more than the one above. 
So again, switching now to some biological metaphors, this is very much like evolution. We've introduced a mutation and that mutation happens to be a beneficial mutation. It produces an individual that has higher fitness or does a better job of what we want it to do than the one before. What does the computer do at this point? The computer would probably delete this one and keep this one and now generate copies of this. And when it generates copies of this AI, it introduces more mutations. It makes other slight changes to this decompression process which produces other virtual robots that move faster or slower. If a mutation is a deleterious mutation, meaning it makes the robot do worse at what we wanted it to do, it moves slower than the parent, we delete that AI or that piece of DNA, throw it away and keep the ones that move a little bit faster. And so now we've switched to an algorithm in which you can think of there being not just two, but hundreds of these AIs existing in a population. Each one produces a robot that moves at some certain speed. We delete the, the DNA that generates slower moving robots, and we make randomly modified copies of the robots that are moving a little bit faster. This particular kind of AI not surprisingly, is known as an evolutionary algorithm. And if we repeat this process over and over again, we eventually can design in silico, in a virtual environment, a fast moving robot. And then sometimes we take that design, we take that design and try and build it in reality. Um, this is something we're still working on. Um, I was going to show you one of these small uh, cubes here. Um, as I mentioned before, each one of these purple cubes that you see here, uh, it's hollow inside and it's made of uh, a very soft silicone rubber. Um, and you can see on the left here, there's a little cable in which we're supplying a little bit of air into the body of this robot but it's, it's breathing. Um, so we're still working on translating these AI designed robots from silico, from inside the virtual world to the physical. That's, that's robotics um, and that's AI designed robots. We're gonna shift gears now um, and talk about a, a related project, which is the Xenobots uh, project. In this case, what you're going to see in this next project is more or less the same AI that I just described to you that generates these virtual creatures. But instead of trying to then translate these virtual creatures uh, into robots using technological components like uh, air valves and silicone and rubber and metal and ceramics and circuits and sensors and motors. Instead, we're gonna take these virtual creatures and try and turn them into a machine that's built from biological components from cells and that's Xenobots. So let me sort of tell you the origin story for Xenobots. Um, about 10 years ago, my group uh, teamed up with uh, Michael Levin and Doug Blackiston at Tufts, uh, two biologists. And around that time, Doug uh, and Mike published a, a paper in the Journal of Experimental Biology, where they demonstrated that they could reach in and surgically rearrange uh, body parts of a tadpole and not only would that surgical rearrangement of the body parts in the tadpole not kill the tadpole, but the tadpole grew into a perfectly healthy adult frog. What did they do? Uh, they performed a ectop ectopic surgery, meaning they moved some parts around. Um, Doug introduced the genetic mutation into, uh, into the original embryo that led to this tadpole where uh, it would not grow eyes in the normal place. So this is genetically blinding uh, the, the organism. And introduced when it reached, uh, when it reached this developmental stage, Doug introduced eye precursor cells into the tail uh, of the tadpole. This is a, a form of stem cells that are destined to become eyes. 
what happened in this case is these cells, which would normally have uh, emerged at this place on the tadpole, emerged down here. And somehow, as this tadpole gradually grew into an adult frog, these I precursor cells reached out uh, to the spinal cord of the frog, and the spinal cord sent out feelers to these I precursor cells. They started to connect to one another, and whatever it was that they were saying to each other was sufficient to convince these I, these I precursor cells to form up into an adult frog eye, which as the tadpole grew into a frog and the tail is absorbed into the posterior of the frog, this became a fully functioning eye on the back of the frog. And as I mentioned, the adult frog survived perfectly well and could actually perform phototaxis. It could sense the direction of light using this eye on its back. This is an interesting biological result for many reasons. Um, for us as roboticists and AI researchers, it was interesting because it, suggest, it suggested a fascinating possibility, which is here we have a human that rearranged tissue of an organism to produce the adjacent possible, to produce a frog that's not quite a frog. That led us to ask the question, could we bring in our AI methods and could we now ask the AI to find ways to rearrange the parts of a frog to produce another adjacent possible, another organism that is somewhat like a frog, but also not like a frog. We worked on this for about uh, four years leading up to 2019, uh, in which we published a paper demonstrating that absolutely yes, we can use the AI that I just showed you, this AI method, to figure out how to rearrange frog tissue to produce a not frog, the xenobot. So let me walk you through how we did this. I'm sorry, we published in 2020. In the years leading up to this publication, when we were first starting to work with uh, Doug Blackiston and Mike Levin, uh, I brought on my then PhD student, Sam Kriegman, who did all the coding and did all the hard work here. So the four of us sat down and tried to figure out how we were going to do this. At the beginning, uh, Doug told us that there were two uh, cell types that he could extract from very early frog, which is uh, frog skin cells which as you saw in the previous project, are soft and passive. Frog skin, like human skin, doesn't actuate. It doesn't have its own ability to move. It is passively pulled and pushed by other parts of the frog body. Doug told us that he could also liberate from early frog embryo uh, myocardiac cells, myocardiac tissue. These are heart muscle cells that are active, they will spontaneously increase and decrease uh, in volume. Sam, my coder, sat down and created a virtual world. And in that virtual world, it was somewhat like Minecraft. You could place these two different kinds of cubes, soft passive cubes and active soft cubes, cubes that got bigger and smaller. We connected that biophysical model, that virtual world, to the AI, which is then going to search over the space of all possible ways of combining these two different types of Lego bricks to explore the morpho space for frogs, the space, the adjacent possible to frog. Any questions, comments? Don't be shy. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Again, a lot of material here. Okay. So uh, when we ran this AI, uh, this is what it started with. So as I mentioned, um, here are the, the, vir the three, vir three virtual creatures. There were actually 200 virtual creatures to start. And each of these three virtual creatures was generated from uh, one of these uh, randomly wired up AIs or neural networks. So it's decompressing uh, a couple of numbers into a bunch of numbers, which are then interpreted by the physics engine or this biophysical model as this thing. So you can see in this case, the AI in effect said, place a whole bunch of passive soft simulated frog skin cells here and place some um, uh, simulated frog heart muscle cells here. Here's another one. Here's another one. We then told the evolutionary algorithm 
to evolve us one of these AIs that would generate a virtual uh, bot that moves from left to right as fast as possible. Exactly the same as in the previous project. As you can see, none of these three robots are moving very quickly from the left uh, to the right. If you squint very carefully, you'll notice that this one actually moves from the right to the left. I, I had the virtual camera in the wrong place. So you'll have to trust me. This one at the bottom is moving a very small distance from left to right, a little bit more than the middle one and the top one. So in this case, the evolutionary algorithm deletes the top AI, the middle AI, and keeps the bottom AI. It makes a copy of this bottom AI and mutates it a little bit, changes this decompression algorithm a little bit, so it generates a slightly different combination of blue and red-green uh, voxels, 3D pixels. Uh, I see Nora has her hand up. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to clarify, um, because the it seems important to sort of track carefully, like the the algorithm, um, the evolutionary algorithm searches over computations, right? And I'm kind of curious how well the translation from like the computational model to then like the actual like, implemented robots, like how oh, how yeah. robust is this translation, or how often are you like actually? But if we implement it in reality, it just like doesn't doesn't quite do the thing we were expecting it to do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm typing this into chat here. So this is known in robotics as the sim to real problem. So we're looking at sim here. And you're probably thinking what would happen if we try if we actually tried to build this from frog skin cells and frog heart muscle cells, would they actually do this? That's the sim to real problem. And the, the short answer to your question is, it doesn't transfer transfer very often at all. Um, going back to if we go back from frog cells back to silicone cubes, you can eat, probably see even just by looking at this, that it'd be very difficult to translate any of these simulated voxel bots into a physical voxel bot. There's a lot of differences between the physics engine or the model and the real world. This is still an open problem. So in this, but it is possible, it does happen. It doesn't, not every translation works. Some works and some translations work, some don't. So we're, in this project, we were very nervous that it was very, it was probably unlikely that anything would transfer, anything that the AI dreamed up was unlikely to survive into reality. So our, our, our real research question is almost an engineering question. Could we build in reality anything that the AI generated? And it turns out the answer is uh, yes. So this particular Xenobot that you see here, I'm going to show you how we turn this particular one into reality, um, if this video plays, and I hope it does. Let's try that again. I'm not sure why one video is playing and another one is not. I have another version of it a little further along. Okay, we'll have to skip ahead to this one. So I'll ask you just to pay attention to the top half of the video. After running our evolutionary algorithm on the supercomputer here in Vermont for two weeks, this is what the evolutionary algorithm came up with, this particular design. You'll notice that in this design, it placed most of the frog skin cells on the top and the heart muscle cells underneath. And this thing actually does move from left to right. And I'm giving away the punchline from our joke, which is uh, Doug Blackiston, our microsurgeon, actually was able to build a physical version of this that also moves from left to right along the bottom of the Petri dish. Okay, let me back up a few slides now and I'll show you a few more details of how we went from sim in the top to real in the bottom. Okay, so once we had that design in the top half of that video that I just showed you, we sent that to Doug and Doug is a very accomplished microsurgeon. So in the video that I'll start playing for you here now, 
you're looking down through the microscope with Doug. We're looking down into a Petri dish. It's about the size of a hockey puck. That Petri dish is filled with room temperature fresh water. And in the, in, the, in the floor of that Petri dish, there's a small uh, well, a small indentation. And what Doug has done is to scrape off a few, skin, uh, a few stem cells from very early frog embryo. This is basically a frog egg. And he's extracted, uh, in this case, about 2,000 stem cells from that frog egg. And that's what you're seeing here, each of these small white uh, dots is an individual frog uh, cell. He drops them into this little indentation and they sort of passively settle into the bottom of this indentation. But you can see that these cells are also kind of active. They're kind of, they don't like to be on their own. They seem to be pulling inward and recreating a multicellular something. They don't, individual cells don't like to be on their own. They know that if they're on their own, they're in trouble. They should usually be connected to something else. So if we think of Doug Blackiston, our microsurgeon here now, as, as a sculptor, this is him like collecting some clay from which he's going to start making this thing. Um, Simon says, it looked like in your sim the heart cells were expanding and contracting out of sync with each other. How is that controlled? And how did the synchronization behavior of the heart cells work in reality? It's a great question. So let me show you what Simon is uh, describing. You, you'll see that each individual cube is flashing from red to green. Green is when it's expanding and red is it contracting. Um, all of these simulated heart muscle cells are out of phase with one another. They're out of sync with one another. That luckily is not true of the heart cells in your heart. All of your heart cells increase in volume at the same time and all your heart cells decrease in volume at the same time. They are synchronized, which allows them to push all of the blood out of your heart. And when they increase in volume, they expand and pull blood back into the heart which allows your heart to act as a pump. Uh, there are, uh, there are um, heart disease, various kinds of heart diseases where that process fibrillation is one of them, where different parts of your heart get bigger and smaller out of sync with one another, which causes your heart to stop acting as a pump. When Doug, the microsurgeon, told us he could extract heart cells and put them together, in new shapes, shapes unlike a frog heart cell, we asked him sort of the question that, that Simon just asked, which is, will they synchronize when they're reconstituted into a new shape or will they just be completely out of sync with one another? Doug's answer was, who knows? We have absolutely no idea. So with that uncertainty, when we built this model, we made things hard on the AI. We started from uh, a parsimonious assumption. We, we told the AI, assume that these individual heart cells will misbehave. They will never synchronize. So obviously this makes things difficult for the AI because it's like asking someone to um, design a boat. You want that boat to move through water. You can design the shape of the boat however you want. You can put human rowers into the boat wherever you want, but these human rowers, they're not gonna synchronize with one another. They're gonna do different things. <laughs> How do you design such a boat so that the boat goes straight? How do you create a machine from out of, randomized or out of sync or misbehaving parts so that the machine as a whole is less unreliable, it's more reliable. And you can kind of see the reason Oh, now it's playing. You can kind of see the reason why in this video here, you can see the unsynchronized heart muscle tissue on the ventral or the bottom surface of this bot. And remember that the, uh, remember that the skin cells are passive and soft. They absorb the impulse forces. So they're, they're being pushed and pulled and they respond slowly to those individual pushes and pulls. So what happens, or what seems to happen, and we're still analyzing this three years on, what seems to be happening in the dorsal or the upper part of this creature is the soft material is kind of averaging all of these individual forces 
coming from the unsynchronized heart muscle tissues, averaging them, and that average force allows the robot to move in a synchronized manner. It, this robot moves in a more or less straight line. So in essence, the body of this machine, which is designed by an AI, is de-randomizing the individual randomized actions of the parts from which it's made. Make sense? Again, thank you for bringing that up, Simon. I think this is, again, a good example of the adjacent possible. This is not necessarily the way a human engineer would try and build things. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so I was showing you, uh, I was showing you Doug starting to build, Doug the microsurgeon starting to build one of these uh, xenobots. The cells settle in the bottom of the well, and in this case, uh, Doug was trying to build this machine, which has heart cells on the bottom. So Doug it would initially sprinkle um, heart uh, myocardiac stem cells, so stem cells that are most likely destined to mature and become heart muscle cells. Puts them on the bottom. Once those settle, then he sprinkles a layer of skin cells on top. So it's almost like assembling a sandwich in layers. So you got muscle stuff on the bottom and skin stuff on the top. Once all of those cells have settled, um, cells tend to be sticky early in embryogenesis, so they all stick together and form a mass, which you can kind of see here. This is later in the assembly process. Now Doug is going to go in with uh, microsurgical uh, implements and gradually scrape away unwanted material to capture the 3D geometry of this AI-generated bot. Um, at this point, Doug actually has the bot uh, on its back, and you can see these like little stubby legs pointing up, and he's sort of scraping away the in interstitial or the inter the material between these little stubby uh, legs. Just for a sense of proportion here, this uh, this little thing is about one millimeter across. Imagine looking through a microscope and trying to sculpt an individual poppy. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, Doug never drinks coffee or Coke, and no caffeine. He has extremely steady hands. He's like, you know, a world class, uh, you know, violinist, you know, very, very good at what he does. Very few people can do this. This is a very high skilled uh, job. And Nora says, just noticing how different this approach is from something closer to 3D printing the biomass. Yep, absolutely. So there are, you know, there are emerging bioprinters out there. Uh, I know I'm biased. None of them can match in skill and detail what what Doug can do can do here. Okay. Any other questions about that before I push on? Okay, so this is Doug sort of finishing this, uh, this manufacture process. Doug then takes this upside down uh, Xenobot and puts it right side up on the bottom of the Petri dish. So it's lightly resting on the bottom of the Petri dish. Um, this uh, frog cells are slightly, um, have slight negative buoyancy. So it settles to the bottom. And this is kind of like running along the bottom of the lake or running along the bottom of a pool. So it's going to, in the next video, which I've already shown you, we're now looking from the top. And again, it's sped up uh, four times. You can see uh, you can see this thing moving along the bottom of the Petri dish. So we're zoomed in to about uh, a three millimeter length view. And uh, we've sped up the video four times. So to give you a sense of what this would actually look like in reality, if you were to look into the Petri dish without a microscope, just with the unaided eye, you'd see something that looks like a poppy seed moving about one millimeter per second, more or less. So you could just perceive that it's moving. Uh, the second part of this video here, this was a, a control experiment we performed to prove, see, I'll just pause here. This was a control experiment to prove that the AI design geometry and distribution of cell types is what led to what we wanted, which was movement along the bottom of the Petri dish. So here's uh, not that not that actual Xenobot, but it's another one that Doug made from the same blueprint. 
that's moving, this is sped up 75%. We took that design and then flipped it on its back. So it's the same, same thing you're gonna, same Xenobot, but now it doesn't move. So it now in essence has a different 3D geometry and a different distribution of cell, uh, cell type. So now you've got muscle on the top and skin on the bottom and it no longer moves. So this was to rule out controls like maybe the maybe the table is tilted or something else. The behavior that we're obtaining in the top half of this video is because of the AI generated design. Yes, Nora. So one question I have is, so this seems sort of like an existence proof for sort of like at least some some fairly simple uh, capability then that, that the system then has. And I'm yes. curious to what extent you think it's like correct or valid to treat this as an existence proof for like like any as also like being able to like implement sort of even higher level capability or do you think when scaling up these sort of systems like just generally novel challenges will come up that we again will have to like actually see whether we can can take them or not it's a great question the answer is we have absolutely no idea whatsoever it is exactly what you said this was just to prove that we could do it and Trust me, I've been working on sim to real for 20 years. It's a hard thing to do. I, you know, I was very nervous that it was just impossible. So th this was just an existence proof and obviously very, very simple behavior. Um, I don't know if anybody has a Roomba at home that, you know, the robot vacuum cleaner that just kind of moves around and, and vacuums up the floor. It's not so it's not so complicated either, but it's useful. So th that's kind of the level of machine we're thinking about here, right? Something that can just kind of move around and push or organize material. In terms of more complicated, you know, sensor motor behaviors or cognitive behaviors, we have absolutely no idea. I will tell you, however, as you can probably guess, we've got a fair amount of funding given this project to try and figure out exactly that. So we are definitely um, working on that. And we can talk now or we can talk a little bit later about sort of the future directions of this work, where we're going with it. And one of them is exactly that. How can we scale up the complexity of uh, what these things can do? Yeah, great question. Okay, um, so just a couple things to point out about this project. Um, I think, you know, AI design biology, this is the future. It may not be Xenobots in particular, that what I just showed you is an example of AI design biology, but the fact that, you know, AI now knows how to manipulate proteins to create new kinds of drugs uh, at the micro scale, that AI now knows how to rearrange cells to create new kind of millimeter sized organisms or machines that's the mesoscale this is just this kind these these convergences of technology of tech and bio um, are just beginning and it really is the tip of the the iceberg so i know there's some biologists here um, maybe some technical folks uh, there is it's a gold rush there is so much that can that can be done here uh, i i encourage you to seek out opportunities to work to work with AI design biology. It's extremely exciting. I mentioned that the particular AI we're working with are these evolutionary algorithms. They're very simple algorithms. You generate a bunch of random things, you delete the ones that don't do a good job at what you want, and you make randomly modified copies of the things that survive. That algorithm's actually been around since the 1960s. We're just applying it here now to a, a more modern problem. <laughs> Like bio, biological evolution, um, evolutionary algorithms generate not just one solution to your problem, but untold numbers of them. So the Xenobot that I just showed you, it's this one over here. Um, it generated, in this first experiment, it generated 99 other designs. And we showed these 100 designs uh, to Doug, our microsurgeon, and he ruled out 95 of them immediately and said, I just, I can't build them. There, there's reasons why I can't reach in and put a, cell, a muscle here and skin here. So he ruled out a whole bunch, which left these five that he thought he could build. And as you can see, he did build them. And I showed you the results from this fourth one here. So 
again, one of the amazing things about AI uh, generated biology or AI generated anything is you can just keep turning the crank. If something doesn't work, you can just ask the AI to generate another one and another one and another one until something does work. And in our case, by work, we mean that it's something that Doug can build. And when he builds it, it actually retains the AI generated behavior in reality. Uh, some other things that have emerged from this project, uh, just for fun, Doug put a bunch of these Xenobots together uh, in a dish. I mentioned um, uh, early frog embryo cells are a little bit sticky. So you can see them temporarily adhering to one another and moving as a collective. My PhD student Sam simulated that process in the upper half of this video and also sprinkled some small material into the dish. And you can see that even with these relatively simple behaviors, these bots just probably by chance start to push material into uh, clumps. So one of the very first um, practical applications that we're um, in the process of working with some companies on is uh, collecting microplastics. So you probably know that there's huge fishing trawlers that are now out in the Pacific Ocean pulling the tons of, of plastic out of the oceans. But getting the microplastics out is much more difficult. Um, so something like uh, Xenobots might be a good solution for those kinds of applications. Because these bots are in essence frog, they're genetically unmodified frog cells. So when these Xenobots eventually die, they just rot back into the background biota in, in the ecosystem. We're not pollutants from the ocean at the same time as we're introducing pollutants by broken down machines and, and what have you. Whether that practical application will uh, become commercially viable or useful, we, we will see. But just to give you a sort of sense of some of the th practical uses this technology might be eventually put to. Um, Nora, you were asking about sort of how we scale up to more complex behaviors. Um, what you can see in this particular video here in the bottom, at least, um, this particular Xenobot seems to be uh, quote unquote interested in this very small particle in its environment. We didn't, the AI didn't design sensors into these Xenobots. So as far as we know, they can't see or sense their environment. But of course, individual cells themselves are fantastically complicated machines. And the surfaces of cells are covered in sensor recept sensory receptors and various kinds of actuators where they apply forces, emit chemicals into their environment. It's not clear to us whether um, we should assume that this bot cannot see this small particle and just by chance happens to be circling it or whether Occam's razor here, whether the simpler uh, assumption is that it does see this particle and is actually quote unquote interested in it. I know there's some uh, philosophers among you there. Um, some of you might know about Daniel Dennett's intentional stance. So does it sort of make sense to uh, in, uh, assume that there's some agency here? Does the Xenobot see is it interested in, does it want to push this, uh, this particle? It's not clear whether, wh which is sort of the default or the null hypothesis here. Maybe something interesting we can discuss uh, in a few minutes. Uh, one last video I wanna show you of the Xenobots is this one. Uh, what you're looking at here is a Xenobot in which Doug is going to reach in now and he's cutting the Xenobot almost in half. And out, over a few hours, this Xenobot uh, automatically self repairs. These frog cells, even though they're in a completely different configuration than they normally would be in a normal developing frog embryo, whatever is going on here, these cells somehow know how to communicate amongst themselves to heal this wound or recover from this repair. It's not clear 
um, whether we should consider these things organisms, frogs, robots, or machines. But of course, if you were to take your laptop and cut it almost in half, it's very unlikely that that laptop is going to fix itself. So one of the other benefits of trying to build machines using biological components like cells rather than technological components like metals and batteries and ceramics is that your, your bio machine comes preloaded with three and a half billion years of experience of dealing with damage, wear and tear, the slings and arrow of, arrow of outrageous fortune, all the terrible things that the real world can throw at you. And cells are very good at being able to recover or deal with surprise, even in surprising circumstances, like being put together in a new, a new pattern. So I like to show this video mostly for the roboticists out there that I think this is a very promising material from which to build robots because or machines in general, because we get some of this useful function for free. Okay, I'm going to switch now between from Xenobots to the last part of what I wanted to present, which are meta materials. Uh, and end with that as an example of the adjacent possible, but I, but this is probably a good place to pause in case there's any other que burning questions people have about uh, Xenobots before I push on. All good? It's going once, going twice? Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned, what you just saw in this video is a machine dealing with surprise, and this is something that's uh, uncomfortable or embarrassing for most of us that work in AI, that even very state-of-the-art AI methods at the moment, they don't deal with surprise very well. It's not that difficult for uh, humans with a sense of humor to find a way to trip up, uh, to trip up machines. I'm sure you've all seen chat GPT fails, you know, there, there are prompt injections now, there, there are ways, it's not that difficult to present a surprising situation to state-of-the-art AI in which it is surprised. So if you haven't seen this before, what you're seeing on the left is a very powerful AI correctly identifying that it's looking at a Granny Smith, you slap on an iPod sticker, and that very same AI immediately is convinced with very high certainty that it is now looking at an iPod. Or, and now it wouldn't uh, succumb to this, what's known as an adversarial attack, but there is still probably an infinite number of other adversarial attacks that it is still uh, sensitive to. So how do we, how do we take this fact that biology seems to still be able to do things much better than machines. And how, how, do we, how do we find in the biology, what is it about the biology that allows it to be safe and aligned, or with, at least with its own survival, in a way that our, our very powerful AI isn't? Very powerful AI is still fragile. It's still unsafe, unaligned with human needs and wants and desires. What's missing from current AI that exists in biology? And that's what I want to talk about in this last part. How do we go about, how do we go about finding in biology the stuff that's missing if we don't know what we're looking for? And again, ironically, I, AI can come to the rescue here, can help. L let me show you how. This is a completely different project. Um, I'll put this on loop as well. Um, this is a project between my group and uh, some of my collaborators uh, at Yale University, Corey O'Hearn, Mark Shattuck, and Rebecca Kramer Botiglio. Um, our collaborators at Yale work on what are known as meta materials. A meta material is an inorganic material um, where you put together very small amounts of inorganic material and you get interesting bulk properties. So, for example, most normal materials, if you take a big block of a normal material, like a piece of wood or, or a piece of rubber, and you push from either sides, it expands out the top and the bottom. You can design a metamaterial that has a very non-obvious bulk property, which is that if you push from both sides, it actually compresses 
from the top and the bottom. That's not something you tend to see in nature. So you can design these metamaterials to have interesting bulk properties. What you're, what you're looking at in this video are three different metamaterials. It's just a line of rubber pucks. So there's nothing very, there's no sophisticated materials here. And it's a little difficult to see from this video, but there's a, there's a periodic motor at the left side that's pushing uh, periodically on the leftmost particle and is basically vibrating the leftmost particle. And that vibration is being amplified and suppressed in different parts of the material. So this is a granular metamaterial, a metamaterial that's made up of a bunch of grains. And it, this is not really a surprising bulk property. There's lots of materials in which if you vibrate a part of the material, different parts of the material vibrate more or less. What was interesting to us is can we design this material so that we can amplify this vibration in certain places and damp this vibration in other places? Why would we want to do that? The reason why uh, the reason why is we're starting to work now on robots that are made of meta materials, made of granular meta materials. Here's an example of one. The uh, li like in the Xenobots project, uh, you can see all these little particles here, and some of these particles um, they're vibrating. They're going back and forth between blue and red. And that vibration is magnified and suppressed at different parts of the body of this machine, which once the AI has tuned these little particles, has set properties of these particles and moved some of these particles around, you get a robot. You get something that moves by vibrating different parts of its body. This is a particle-based robot. Uh, this is a very recent work. It has not yet been published yet. It's going to be published uh, next month. And you can't really see the particles here, but here's a physical uh, version of one of these robots. Inside this robot are a whole bunch of vibrating particles. So this is a robot made from metamaterials. The next thing we would probably have to do, again, going back to one of Nora's questions, is this isn't a very complicated behavior. If we wanted more complicated behaviors, we'd probably have to put sensors and motors in. We'd have to put some electronics in to compute, to translate sensor signals into motor signals. Before we started to do that, we asked another question, which is, do we have to put electronics in to get this thing to compute? Or maybe the material itself can compute. Again, for the philosophers among you, as we all know, Rene Descartes in the 1600s told us that brain and body are separate. The body moves and the brain, or at least for Descartes, the soul thinks. These are separate things. One of the interesting things I think in this project that I'm going to show you now is when you work with certain materials, there is no distinction between the physical part, the part that's vibrating and making this thing move, and the computational part. How is it that vibrating, how is it that vibrating particles can compute? I'm going to show you how. Before I do, for the non-computer folks among you, we're going to look at computer engineering for babies. If you have any young kids at home, I recommend this book. Uh, even the non-computational folks among you, you probably know that computers are made up of Boolean logic gates. Um, there are different kinds of Boolean logic gates. Here's a pretty good visualization of what these different gates do. Here's an OR gate. If one or both buttons are pressed, the output lights up. An AND gate requires you for both inputs to light up. An XOR gate, only one lights up. There's a latch and so on. So inside all computational devices that we've designed are a whole bunch of these little logic gates that are today made from transistors. My other PhD student, uh, Atusa Parsa, discovered Oops, that's not what I want. Let me try that again. Let's 
try that again. Apologies. Okay, I'll just leave it in presenter mode for a moment. There's a lot going on in this slide, so I'm going to I'm going to walk you through what's going on in this slide. You're looking at a simulated metamaterial. Let's look at the the uh, panel in the very top left. So we have a bunch of vibrating particles. Um, you're looking at a rectangle of particles. This is actually particles that are wrapped in a cylinder. So this and this are the same particle. Um, there's reasons for that we don't need to go into today. The color of the particle represents how, uh, how hard or how soft uh, it is. So darker particles are stiffer. They're, you can think of them as like steel ball, ball bearings. And the light colored uh, circles are very soft particles. You can think of these as like partially filled uh, air balloons. It turns out that with these vibrating particles, you can get an AI to design these particles to set the stiffnesses of these particles so that together these particles act like a, a Boolean logic gate. Uh, how does this work? Um, as I showed you in the previous video, all uh, logic gates, most logic gates take two inputs and produce one output. There's two inputs here, the blue, uh, the green particle and this blue particle over here. These are the two inputs. And uh, in this case here, these two input particles are not being uh, agitated. We are not vibrating these particles. There is one other particle down here. This is the source particle. This is this purple particle is always vibrating. There's a motor attached to it that's always shaking that particle back and forth. So in this particular example here, we are not shaking the green and the blue particle. And the red particle is exhibiting a little bit of oscillation, but not too much. So you can think about this as us not pressing the green and the blue input buttons. So the input is zero, zero, and we're getting not quite zero, but close to zero output. We take exactly the same meta material, we let it uh, rest, we let all the, the oscillations wash out of the material, we start shaking the purple source particle again, this is basically like a power source if you like. And in this case, we do not shake the green particle, zero, and we do shake the blue particle. So we're basically pressing the blue button, but not pressing the green button. And in this takes a little bit to see, but we get a lot more, we get a higher amplitude oscillation of the red particle, which you can see down here. So over here, we pressed zero, zero, and got zero out. Over here, we're pressing zero, one, and getting a one out at the red particle. Again, that's a lot of information. I'll just pause for a moment. Anything I can clarify? So far, so good? Like maybe okay. just very quick, like suggest a high level summary and then you can tell me whether that seems right. Like this okay. might be an example of how sort of we go from the continuous world we observe in biology sort of to the discrete world of like computationalism and, and logic gates and stuff. Is that a fair? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's a continuous world, but it's not biology. These are still like, these are just plastic pucks, right? So this is a continuous material that's been designed to act, to, to instantiate a Boolean logical operation. So just to finish this off, so you can imagine where we're going. We take the same material and we do the third case. We shake the green particle back and forth and we do not shake the blue particle. And we see high amplitude at the output particle, the red. So this is the one zero case. And in this fourth and final case, same material, we take the green and the blue particle and we shake them back and forth. And we see little to no uh, oscillation in the red particle. So this continuous material is acting more or less like exclusive or 
And again, for the benefit of the non-computational folks, I'll play this video again. Watch for X or in the video. Okay, so exclusive uh, exclusive or is you know a very valuable building block. It's sort of an atomic component for all you know all the computational technology that exists on Earth. We as a species have decided to to build those building blocks out of discrete components. But as Nora was mentioning, here's a continuous material that does it, which is fine. But it's not really the adjacent possible. We know that biology also computes and most of biology, not all of biology, is also continuous. So wh what are we really learning here? Wh what we learned in this project is my PhD student Atusa took this one step further and found that there was something that you could do with this continuous, uh, this logic gate made from continuous material that you cannot do with logic gates that are made from discrete components. And I'll describe that in a moment. But let me respond to um, Jason's question, which is, how sensitive is this to relative phase differences between the different driving forces? Um, that's a good question. Um, so you're looking at just one AI designed material. Some of them are sensitive to phase uh, phase offsets. If there's a, even a little bit of a phase uh, diversion, they don't they don't work anymore. The function collapses. Other materials. Other materials that also instantiate exclusive ore seem to be much more robust to phase differences, and at the moment we have no idea why that's uh, the case. In this project, we're also looking at allowing the AI to alter um, the way in which we perturb the input port. So allow AI to say, you should, you should shake these uh, particles with this much phase offset. And if you do, you'll get exclusive or. If you shake those particles in exactly the same material, you'll get and or nand or something else. So one of the things Atus is struggling with is um, that this is in essence kind of a reprogrammable material. You can, you can program different computational functionality into it, but exactly how to do that, we're still working on that. Okay, great question, Jason. So as I just mentioned uh, about a minute ago, Atusa found that there is something you can get these, this continuous media to do that discrete media like transistors cannot do, and it's the following. So um, let me go back to full screen. Hopefully, there we go. Here's one material that uh, the AI found that instantiates uh, and. So when you don't shake both input ports, you get a zero. When you shake one of the input ports, you get zero. When you shake just the other input port, you get zero. And only when you shake or oscillate both input ports, the green and the blue particle, only then do you see an oscillation at the red particle. So this particular material, AI design material, instantiates and. This different material, you can see a different distribution of stiff and soft particles. This one instantiates uh, exclusive ore, which I just showed you in the previous video. Atusa asked the following question. What happens if you take a material and you oscillate it at two different frequencies simultaneously. This is known as frequency mixing. So you'll notice uh, if you look carefully in the magenta uh, box here, you'll see there's a low frequency sine wave going up and down. And inside each of the peaks and inside each of the troughs of this low frequency signal, there is a superimposed high frequency signal. So you can think of this as us putting into these two particles, zero and one at one frequency, the low frequency, and at the high frequency at the same time, we're supplying to that same two input ports, another pair of binary values, it happens to be the same pair, zero and one. Everyone with me so far? So 
in a normal transistor and in the baby book I just showed you, it's normally there's only one bit arriving at the input port. You're either pressing the button or you're not. This is like that there's one button, but you're able to press or not press it twice at the same time. Gets a little confusing, but hopefully you're still with me. Atusa was able to get the AI to design a material that is acting like an AND gate in response to the low frequency input. So if you look at these four cases here, at the low frequency, we see the low frequency only show up in the fourth case, in the one one case. So if we just pay attention to low frequency, this, this thing is acting like an AND gate. But at the same time, and in the same place, at the same output port, at the higher frequency, this particle is acting like an exclusive OR gate. You can see the high frequency only showing up in the second and the third case. So, oh, I, I, I neglected to draw the picture here. The picture is basically these two things, these two symbols superimposed on top of one another. This material acts, uh, performs two different logical operations in the same place at the same time, just at different points on the frequency spectrum. No computer, no matter how fast or powerful it is on Earth at the moment, does that with the exception of quantum computers. And they do it through exploiting quantum effects. This material does the same does something similar two computations in the same place at the same time uh, without recourse to quantum effects jason asks what are the wavelengths and frequencies involved here uh, i don't jason i don't remember this is obviously a cartoon picture from the paper so i'll refer you to the paper down below you can go in and get the actual uh, units from from there but good question sorry i can't answer that online for you Okay, so that's, I would argue, at least for me, this is one of the more interesting sort of adjacent possibles we've stumbled across. It leads a lot of people to the next question, which is, is this what biology is doing? So um, for the neuroscientists among you, you probably know there's this running joke about the, the brain is X. So um, in, the in the 1800s, leading into the 1900s, the brain was a series of, uh, of valves, water pressure flowing from one pipe to another. Then in the early 1900s, the brain was a series of telegraph wires connected together. Then in the early 1950s, 1960s, the computer was a telecommunications network then in the late 20th century the computer was the internet now the current metaphor is maybe the brain is a meta material we most of us were taught in neuroscience 101 that a neuron receives a whole bunch of input signals combines them and performs an operation one operation and supplies that as output Atusa's material here is performing two computations simultaneously by exploiting uh, um, uh, oscill oscillatory phenomena, basically playing in the frequency space. So this, this was leading us to think maybe cells or maybe neurons do something similar. Last week, uh, Atusa sent me this preprint, and sure enough, it seems that neurons maybe not are doing exactly what I just showed you, but it seems that there is evidence that neurons are mixing frequencies. So this is from figure one of this preprint. Um, here's the title and authors. You can find it. I think it's on the bio archive. Um, here's a neuron receiving uh, signals at two different frequencies. And depending on where you measure in the, in the cell body, you can actually get out uh, a combined signal. You, it's mixing these frequencies together in not just one way, but several ways. So it's, it's either adding and or multiplying these signals together. So this is possible with metamaterials. And 
as of very recently, it now seems that neurons are doing this as well. And this is very different from how we do computation in computer circuits or even deep neural networks. So here's an example of something that is, ab that is definitely missing from state-of-the-art AI technology. It's not known whether it's a use whether it's a useful thing. If we were to incorporate this into computers and deep neural networks, would it make computers faster or at least would it make computers more computationally dense? And if we were to bring this phenomenon of frequency mixing into deep neural networks, would it make them faster, more accurate, safer? I don't know. But again, it's an example of this kind of circuitous route of going from AI to a discovery of something in a technology, asking whether that thing found in the technology exists in biology, finding that yes, it does exist in the biology and it's missing from most traditional technology. And maybe this is a missing piece. Maybe this is something we should incorporate back into our intelligent machines. I'm going to I'm going to wind up now, but just to pull back from this last part, if you think about what current AI can and can't do very well and ask, you know, are there things in biology that allow biological systems to be relatively safe and act relatively intelligently? Are there phenomena? Are there are there things that Mother Nature and evolution has exploited in us that allows us to be smart and safe, at least for ourselves that's missing? The answer is probably yes, because there's a gazillion phenomena at work in us. My personal view is this sort of, um, there's this sort of hubris in AI and robotics that we just need more data and compute. You know, we've, we've captured the most important things from biology in deep neural networks, and now we just need to push, yeah? It seems unlikely to me that that's true, but that's just my personal uh, opinion. So I will wrap up by um, thanking my students on the left, uh, in particular, Atusa, David, and Sam. They did all the actual hard work that I showed today, of course, and I just got to trumpet their achievements. Uh, I mentioned all the metamaterials work. That was a collaboration uh, between myself and some folks at Yale. And all the Xenobots work that I just showed you, that was a collaboration uh, between myself and Sam and Doug and Mike at Tufts. And I will stop there and be happy to discuss all this with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I will quickly, I will start with a question on my own and then give give the rest of the audience a bit of time to, to react as well. I think there's like a bunch of questions here. And um, I think, especially in the last part, sort of like, what are the parallels here with like AI applications um, towards robustness? What, what is already happening versus not? Um, but I, I want to sort of start maybe with a much more bigger picture question, um, starting with this, like starting from where you started with the like adjacent possible. And mm -hmm. like the question is something like, cool, so we have this sort of like the total space of possible morphologies, possible sort of instantiation of intelligent behaviors. Um, and you gave us a lot of examples of how maybe we can like use AI to enhance our ability to like search through the, the space and, and, and find interesting um, things to manifest. Um, yeah. I'm curious, so I, I would claim that it's quite likely that in this in this total space, there's also um, things that would sort of be functionally coherent um, but that we might not want to instantiate because they would be dangerous. Um, so yes. there's, I think the most obvious example is sort of engineered patho pathogens, but we can obviously think of like various other, other things. And, and then I think the question maybe becomes something like, so Rick, rather than simply advancing um, our ability to just like brute force search through the space, um, what would it look like if we were like about built ability to search through the space in sort of specific ways, right? Search through um, the space to find morphologies with specific, that like comply to specific desiderata, whether that's around safety, robustness, alignment, whatever we might then want, but like sort of have this ability, but we're sort of slightly advanced such that we like also can yeah. find and avoid specific um, spaces in this in this big space. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, it's, it's a, I have many thoughts. I'll, I'll keep them brief. 
it's a really good question. You know, can we, could we drive AI through the space of all possible technologies or biologies and say, find things that are smart, useful, and not dangerous, right? Um, my experience with AI, and I, I, will, I will speak for many of my AI colleagues, that hasn't worked and probably will never work. In, in AI, it's known as perverse instantiation, or it was known as perverse instantiation. Most people now know it as the alignment problem, right? That no matter how smart we humans think we are in saying we want the desiderata, we want X, Y, and Z, and we don't want A, B, and C, it is, it is turning out for us, it's surprisingly easy for an AI to find something that it, to find an artifact that instantiates X, Y, and Z and does not instantiate A, B, and C and is still dangerous, right? Because there was D, which we didn't think about in, until in retrospect, right? And so I, my personal feeling, this is a little bit skeptical for a moment, I, the proactive stance that we can proactively tell the AI what to find and what to avoid I think is impossible. That the best we can do is retroactive safety. Just proceed assuming that it will always find something that is useful and dangerous in surprising ways. And how do we ameliorate, you know, or combat or suppress or snuff out that dangerous technology once it's been found by AI or by us? So, for example, when we published the Xenobots, there, as you can imagine, there was a ton of media attention and a lot of fear. You know, you're making these killer frog bots. You know, they're going to escape from the lab. You know, and my view on that was we couldn't promise that they won't ever escape from the lab, or we couldn't promise that somebody wouldn't download our code base from GitHub and be good enough to figure out how to put together viruses or cells to make something to make a new pathogen. The best we can do is to know that that's possible. And once this technology is out there, is that there's enough infrastructure that the, the good guys and girls can very quickly follow it up with, we, we can just say, tell the AI, design something that snuffs out that new pathogen. COVID is a perfect example, right? There was no way we could ever prepare our society that something like COVID or whatever the next pathogen is will ever, you know, get loose. The best we can do is minimize the time until we find a vaccination or a therapy or something that can snuff it out. And my hope with all of this AI design biology is that the time between the release of something that's dangerous and the time of something that can snuff it out becomes shorter and shorter. I think we would be setting us up, we would be setting ourselves up for trouble if we assume that we could hope that that would never happen that we can you know have the genie and not let the genie out of the bottle that that's very in my my experience very very difficult to do it's a bit of a cynical view but there you go yeah just a quick follow-up question sure. um i think I'm, I'm quite curious sort of like in in your research space or in sort of the community like this sort of work is happening yeah. what seems to sort of be the attitudes that are also related to things like the role of policy or like another question that comes up in the AI space is around open sourcing versus not open sourcing um, because there's a bunch of sort of like downstream consideration around like like safety and like what are these these like risks and uh, trade-offs do, yeah. do you have like sort of either sort of what are the general views there or like what are your perspectives that like might be parallels yeah I Absolutely. So, um, so as, you know, we've been involved in sort of the policy debates and, and policy discussions here in the U.S. You know, in, around AI design biology. So, the regulatory bodies, the 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 Food and Drug Administration here in the U.S., the FDA, other various groups here, they they can see what's happening with AI, and they understand AI biology enough to know that. <laughs> Whatever policy headaches are arising now with AI, they're going to be nothing compared to the policy headaches around AI designed biology. And they're also different. So in a way, the good news for policy around AI is obviously you need ferocious compute and data to be able to make a powerful AI so, for now. So that's good because policy can now focus on 
Google, Microsoft, Meta, you know, you name it. It's, you know, unlikely that someone in a garage is going to make a super powerful AI that can compete with ChatGPT and run amok. Although that also may be not be, may be true for very long. With AI design biology, unfortunately, that, you know, barrier to the bad girls and guys isn't there, right? It's it's not that difficult, you know, to take, as I mentioned, this evolutionary algorithm. For us at the moment, it takes about two weeks to dream up a, a, a Xenobot on a supercomputer. So still pretty considerable compute, but that compute is coming down pretty quickly. I can imagine, you know, in three years, someone can buy a normal person could buy enough GPU on the cloud and, you know, tinker around with some biology to possibly make something that would be dangerous. You know, that's, that's unfortunately reality. How do you, how do you develop policy around that kind of thing? Not, not very easy, not very easy at all. Like I said, I think, you know, it has to be something to do with the fact it's got to be retroactive policy can't we can't develop policy to be proactive you know policy in which you try and stop that from ever happening it has happened in the past it will happen in the future when it happens how do we develop ai technology that you can develop you know a vaccine or you know a blockage for whatever escapes you know in months weeks days hours of its release that's that in my personal opinion that's where policy should focus on and and economic resources human resources and so on cool thank you so much sure um cool so we have one question by clem i'm gonna let them talk or see whether they want to talk i think sure. they can talk now if they yeah, yeah sure um i'm also in a room with several people it's my question but some of them might put their hand up. So if I put my hand up again, it's probably one of them. Um, okay. But yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that a little bit, which is something like, yeah, understanding that maybe the role of policy in this space being constraints, but also maybe noticing, especially if we take the analogy with evolution seriously, noticing the kind of like path dependence of technological progress here, where it's something like you can kind of imagine a lot of different ways this can go, like a lot of different exciting avenues. Maybe you've shown two here with the Xenobots and the metamaterials, but maybe there's dozens. And you could imagine that each of those have a different safety profile. Like maybe with metamaterials, it's a lot easier to imagine how to contain one of these things or how to like set up emergency measures or something that's closer to Xenobots. I'm, not, I'm just speculating here. Something closer to sure. Xenobots would be harder to, to um, have this kind of safety guarantees. And so maybe there's something else going on, which is less to do with like, how do we, it's not maybe putting in complete barriers and constraints, but it's shaping, doing like differential technological progress, shaping which of these technologies we forward, maybe because we can reason about the safety profile downstream. Have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a great point. And again, I should have prefaced, I'm obviously not a policy expert. So I, I'm, you know, these, they're just my personal opinions um, outside my area of expertise. But having spoken with folks in the policy space, I think this is, their big misconception is, you know, treating this all as one, you know, amorphous mass, right? They're, they're monists, there's, there's, there's AI, right? That's the thing that's the problem. And like you said, Clem, it, it, at least for the, you know, the, the practicing, you know, scientists and engineers among us, it's, it's convincing them that, you know, these technologies are all different. Some of them are, you know, more resistant to policy application than others and in different ways it's very difficult and then you know but then that, that requires a lot of education you, you know you, you have to explain these technologies and like you said there's path dependence there's uncertainty even among the the developers of these technologies about which where it's going to go in the future so how do you how do you quantify uncertainty how do you communicate that to non-technical folks in the policy space it's i think maybe also the thing i was saying was closer to not policy but um like things that we can do as scientists, uh, oh, like, okay. like maybe putting spotlight, like maybe like a kind of self-regulation or maybe it looks less like regulation and more like building excitement for those fields that seem like differentially more likely to lead to things which are easier, uh, which have better safety properties. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah, and, and I don't maybe, know. Just yeah, following up a little bit, there might also be an aspect here of like, oh, like a reason why 
uh, we want, in fact, more than just prediction, right? There's often this like, do we need to understand? Is it enough to just predict? Well, one reason maybe to uh, why we want to understand beyond just being able to predict is because um, it will allow us to know what are the different safety profiles or at least have a better guess of what are the different safety profiles so we can more differentially pursue things that are also exciting, but also sort of more amenable maybe to what, what we want them to be in eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and, and again, I think for all of us, this is a new thing, at least, you know, I, f even five years ago in AI and robotics, I don't know, no one even thought about, you know, safety or policy. And so it's, it's new for a lot of us to even say, like, how do you incorporate thinking about the first order, second order repercussions of the work that you're doing? How do you incorporate that, you know, into the educational ladder from, you know, faculty, postdoc, PhD down to K-12? Like, how do you train scientists and engineers, you know, to think humanely and think civilly about and, and vice versa? How do you get STEM folks and non-STEM folks to collaborate to proactively address some of these issues? It's, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Absolutely. It's, it's sort of the, you know, the philosophy and the, the science of science. Well, we have another question by Ali. Um, he's asking, do you think intelligence needs a body? And I want to just follow that up with a question I was noting down as well, which is, I think, basically getting at the same thing. So you initially talked about the space of possible morphologies, the, the robot space, you call it as well. And I'm kind of interested in your thoughts on the relationship between that space and like the space of possible intelligence system. Like, are they just fully overlapping? What's the relationship between morphology and intelligent yeah. behavior more, more generally? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah. Do you think intelligence is a body? So the I I, I wrote I co-authored a book with my PhD advisor Rolf Pfeiffer called "How the Body Shapes the Way We Think." So yes, I think intelligence needs a body. Um, interestingly, the way you phrase that question and the way we phrase the title of the book assumes Cartesian dualism. There's body and there's thinking, or intelligence, right? And one needs the other. They're somehow separate. One of the things that is still sinking in for me about Atusa's work on metamaterials is her metamaterial acts and quote unquote thinks. Maybe exclusive or is not thinking, but it's a type of computation. It isn't, they're not separate. They are the same thing. Action and computation are one and the same thing. And it's, it just depends on how you look at it as the observer. So, uh, I'm, I know I'm not really answering your question, Ali or Nora, but I think what we need to realize is that in biology, thinking and action are the same thing. When a neuron, you know, oscillates, it's acting. It is physically affecting its neighbors and also electrically influencing its neighbors. And that physical, computational, you know, deep intertwining is happening at all scales in living systems. At least in the West, We've been so inculcated with thinking of, you know, body and brain or robot body and computation as separate things. I think that that distinction is going to blur and that's the way to safe machines. If every thought you have has an immediate physical on your neighbors at all physical scales, you're going to think differently. Right. It's not that you know, you know, you don't sit there safely and think and then act there. They are not just intertwined. They are the same thing. That's my two cents on that. Oh, thank you. We have one more question in, in the room. So I think it's going to be Clem's avatar talking. But um, Giles, I think, is asking the question. I think you can own it. Yeah. Hey, um, thanks for a really great talk. So. I am a philosopher and I can't resist the bait you left me for the intentional science stuff. Okay. So um, I just wanted to ask kind of more of a sociological question, which is in robotics and in uh, biology, how do you guys think about these kind of taking the intentional stance towards these, these strange things in order to interpret them? Is it seen as a dangerous game? Is it seen as a useful tool? Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I have to now speak for the whole robotics community. I, here's my, what I have seen, I would guess if you were to poll 10 roboticists, nine of them will not have heard of the intentional stance. It will take a little bit for them to know what, what you mean by that. Um, so I think 
uh, we as roboticists are woefully uneducated and ignorant of you know advances that have made in been made in philosophy about you know where agency lies if it, it lies anywhere uh, so uh, yeah and it, it has real practical consequences you know i've seen roboticists and i've done this myself i'll give it depending on who i'm talking to i will say the robot is thinking about this or the xenobot is planning to turn left and then depend yeah you know, I'll give the same talk to another group and say it's a collection of frog cells and the sensor receptors are picking up this and I, I, I catch myself, you know, stepping in and out of the, the intentional stance. Um, and it's yeah, it's obviously not very, uh, not very good philosophical practice. I, I mentioned I made a point of this because I knew there were some philosophers there th that we really with the xenobots we're confused it's not clear whether it's safer, whether Occam's razor says we should not take the intentional stance or Occam's razor says we should. What is the safer bet? It is, it is really not clear. At the level of the whole bot, the thing that I showed you, there's no sensors. There, there's actuators, which is the, the heart muscle cells for sure, but there's no eyes, there's no ears, but the cells have eyes and ears, but the AI had no control over how the, the cellular sensory receptors are wired up. So does this thing sense? Does it have agency? Does it plan? Does it introspect? Is it capable of introspection, prospection? Who knows? We, knew, we need the philosophers for sure. We're in very deep waters. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful, thanks. Well, there's one more question in the q and a so i'm gonna quickly read it uh so it says from one of the dozen people in the room with clem um how do you think the research programs of biobotics and cerebral organoids relate to each other are they likely to merge move closer together in terms of what sort of creatures they end up producing or are people thinking of adding neural cells in the near future yeah uh, good question um so yeah um I, meant, I mentioned earlier that you can imagine there's a lot of directions or future directions that we're working on with the with the xenobots. We have a very, very long to do list of things we want to try. One of them, again, as Nora mentioned, is try to scale up the complexity of the behaviors. And an obvious way to attempt to do that would be to try and incorporate neural material, neural tissue into the xenobots. That's that's something we may explore in future. I'm interested in, again, this relates back to embodiment that we were just talking about. Cells themselves are very intelligent. So if we want to create useful machines out of biological materials, I want to see, I want to try and get AI to make a, as smart a bio machine as we can without incorporating neural tissue to avoid this potential danger that we, that the, that we build something bills and can can suffer pain again back to the philosophy we can't know we don't know and we can't know and in the absence of being able to know it's maybe good to try and make things with as little you know neural tissue as possible especially especially cerebral prefrontal cortex type stuff there's a lot of examples in biology of non-neural you know plants and animals that do fantastically complicated things why don't we try and build things like that as as helper technologies and the very very last thing we should try and build are things with you know large amounts of cerebral materials cool um i'm gonna check again if there's more questions sure there might be more questions in in the room okay George has a question. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm curious about what you think about um, potential applications of, um, well, I suppose particularly the uh, AI programmed biology, but also the metamaterials to um, medicine and like longevity technologies and things like that. Yeah, great, great, uh, great question. So we have a spin-off company from the Xenobots work 
um, called Fauna Systems, as in flora and fauna. Um, and we are pursuing a number of medical applications there. Um, some of them um, are in the space of regenerative medicine. So I mentioned my colleague, uh, Mike Levin at Tufts. Um, that's really his area of expertise. Uh, I'll just give you a concrete example. So uh, he and some of his colleagues have developed um, a chemical sleeve that you can put on an, uh, an amputated frog, so on the stump of an amputated limb, and that chemical cocktail will convince the cells to start to grow back, uh, uh, to grow back the arm. Um, frogs are like us are not regenerative species. They do not grow back lost limbs. There are other species that do. So that's an existence proof that uh, species that are not natively uh, regenerative can be convinced chemically to regenerate. And there were decades of work that went into that chemical cocktail, and that was all manually done, right? So imagine we now replace that with AI technology that can search for um, combinations of chemical, electrical, and uh, mechan uh, vibrational signals that convince cells to do things they don't normally do in the wild type animal, like regenerate uh, structure. So there's definitely, this is not, I'm sort of in the shallow end of this. Mike is leading most of this, looking at applying this to large, large numbers of uh, medical applications. But the, the main one out in front at the moment is re regenerative medicine. So, so things for uh, amputations, amputees, birth defects, um, that kind of thing. Yep, great question. Thank you. Cool. Um, I'm going to check one more time whether there's any okay. more questions left. Again, on the philosophical theme, I feel like I'm looking into the Chinese room. I know there's a number of people asking smart questions, but I, I can't see inside the room. It's all the same person with uh, different Maybe, maybe. Voices. How do I know? How do I know? Cool. It it looks like it looks like we're pretty good now. Um, okay. thank you so much for your time. This was really interesting, and thanks for engaging with the questions as well. Me too. Thanks to all of you, and and thanks for the really great questions. And I I know you're coming to the end. I hope you had a great uh, summer school. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay. You. All right. Bye bye now, everyone. Bye, bye Joe.